Hey everyone, I'm Fox with Foxo Games, and this is Bioshock for the PC. Not a new game by any means, Bioshock released to critical and popular acclaim on PC, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3 back in 2007, but does the nearly 10-year-old classic still hold up today? Let's take a look. As always, let's begin with the PC port. Bioshock feels mostly native to the PC platform, although it's no surprise that it's missing a borderless windowed mode and a few other options as well. Graphics options include resolutions up to at least my monitor's max of 1920x1080, windowed or full screen mode, and an on-off options for vertical sync, shadow maps, post-processing, high detail shaders, real-time reflections, distortion, global lighting, DirectX 10 detail surfaces, and horizontal field of view lock. There are sliders for actor detail and texture detail, as well as some graphics presets. Unfortunately, there are no tooltips or explanations as for what most of these options do or mean. There is no specific option for anti-aliasing, although it could be included in one of these ambiguously named options for all I know. I turned everything either on or to its highest setting except for windowed mode and vertical sync. In windowed mode, I found my mouse cursor was not aligned properly with the game window. In terms of performance, well, it's an older game, so it's no surprise that it rarely dropped frames on my system. You can see my PC specs at the bottom of the video. At nearly all times, I saw the frame rate stay pretty close to 144, which is my max due to G-Sync technology. I experienced no physics issues or glitches at this high frame rate, which is awesome. You can play with either mouse and keyboard or gamepad, and key binding is available. You can also adjust the volumes for sound effect, music, and voice separately. Overall, excluding a few missing graphics options, I'm happy with this game as a PC title. Now, it's always difficult evaluating the graphics of an older game, since expectations and standards change over time. Despite being nearly 10 years old, Bioshock continues to look good today. Rather than attempt to be photorealistic, Bioshock offers a more stylized look, which helps greatly in keeping the visuals looking good well into the future. Unfortunately, the game's lower resolution textures do stand out quite a bit, and it's impossible not to notice the game's age nowadays. Some aspects of the graphics definitely could have looked better on PC even for the time it was released. Most notably are the game's weapons. Because they're so close to the first person camera, their low resolution blurry textures really stick out in a negative way. Fortunately, as I mentioned above, the visual style and art direction of the game keeps the game's atmosphere despite its age. Like Fallout 3, you get the sense that this game world is a snapshot of an older era, maintained thanks to its seclusion from the rest of the world. Lighting in the game is solid with a good mixture of light and dark areas. Shadows are nice, but they don't have that crisp outline that modern games do. Smoke and water effects look particularly excellent as do the weapon and plasmid effects. Shocking a puddle of water with lightning or igniting a trail of oil on fire looks great. Enemy and NPC character models look decent given the time period. Unfortunately, some of the NPC character models felt like they were lacking frames of animation to me, which is possibly because I was playing at 144 frames per second and they might have animated them for lower frame rates. Where Bioshock really shines is in the details. Whether it's the scribbled creepy messages on the walls, the believable dilapidation of the game's world, or a stray bullet causing a framed poster on the wall to fall to the ground, there was a lot of effort put into making this a highly detailed, believable world. Even the construction and design of the various rooms and hallways fit the aesthetic to a T. As you play Bioshock, you really get the feeling that this was once a grand society that has now fallen apart, and bit by bit, the entire city is coming apart at the seams, both literally and figuratively. In the sound and music department, Bioshock does not disappoint. With a few exceptions, one of the most standout features of the game is the sound engineering. Creepy sounds in the distance pair nicely with the atmosphere set by the visuals. The effects for lightning, fire, and other plasmids have a good solid sound, and there's a good punch to the firearms in the game. When characters and enemies in the game call out to you, whether it's begging for help, seeking repentance, or to threaten you, they sound positively bone-chilling at times. The voice work is amazing, and a stellar example of how to do video game voices right. One of the negative aspects of the sound engineering is the way that many audio tracks will stack on top of one another. I often found it difficult to hear what one of the NPCs was saying to me because of the large explosions or the sounds of me caught in the midst of battle. I understand the desire to keep the flow of the game moving without stopping it for the exposition of the story, but not being able to hear it is never a good thing. Of course, I could have just stopped moving and tried to avoid creating any noisy distractions, but that defeats the purpose of the method of exposition. Also, some sound effects would occasionally cut out on my machine for no apparent reason. While none of the music really stood out to me, it was great at setting the tone and building on an already well-crafted atmosphere. All of these elements, visual, sound effects, and music, work to produce an amazingly compelling atmosphere. In stark contrast to the usual fare for first-person shooters, Bioshock excels in the story department. There's a lot going on here, and you could dig deep into this world through audio logs, character voiceovers, and the various scribblings on the walls. In fact, the very game world itself is telling a story if you're keen enough to catch on to it. 
Most notable is the game's intro. By no means a spoiler, as I'm sure nearly everyone has played this section or at least seen it once, Bioshock begins with the protagonist surviving a plane crash and swimming his way to the entrance to Rapture, the underwater city where you spend the rest of the game. Giving the player control of your character while still in the water was a spectacular move because this unquestionably serves as one of the most incredibly compelling and riveting beginnings to any game ever. It's hard not to be impressed by the sight of airplane parts sinking into the water as jet fuel burns atop the ocean, all the while you're struggling to reach safety. The presence of a set of stairs in a building in the middle of the ocean is quite an unusual sight and the trip down is something special too. As you push forward through the game, most of the exposition occurs in the way of disembodied voices that talk to you, either through the portable radio you have or via one of the numerous audio logs. I've never been a fan of the audio log methodology of exposition, but I do understand the desire to not interrupt the flow of the game for lengthy exposition. After all, this is not a straight up RPG, but essentially a first person shooter, and anything that stops the action dead in its tracks better warrant stopping the action dead in its tracks. I appreciate that Bioshock never really forces you into those scripted scenes where you have to slowly follow a character down a narrow hallway, a staple of many first person shooters nowadays. There's a lot of background story here, as well as a carefully crafted main storyline. It's probably no secret by now what is revealed to the player later in the game, but I'll avoid mentioning this just in case someone hasn't played Bioshock to completion. Suffice it to say that the story has some interesting things to reveal to the player, and I doubt most would see it coming. But how's the gameplay? Well, it's not far off from your average first person shooter, though it does feature two very different offensive classes of weaponry. You have the standard weapons, including a wrench, pistol, machine gun, shotgun, and so on, and then you have the plasmids, which are essentially bio Socks version of magic. These include lightning, fire, and ice ability, telekinesis for moving objects without touching them, insect swarm, and more. Some are very specific, such as an ability to turn security devices against your enemies. I found myself using the ones that had the most utility, mainly just the lightning, fire, and ice plasmids. A standard move that worked on all of your weaker enemies was to simply stun them with lightning and then destroy them with either the wrench or a gun. Many plasmids also have additional utility beyond combat. You can use the fire plasmid to melt ice and open up pathways or secret areas. Telekinesis can be used to manipulate objects that you can see but can't reach. The lightning plasmid will also operate some otherwise broken panels. You can only select a few plasmids to have at your disposal at one time via a vending machine in the game, but you can also upgrade your character to be able to carry more at once. Additional passive bonuses can be slotted into your character with additional slots available to unlock. These include things like higher defense, increased damage with the wrench, and easier hacking. Speaking of hacking, there's a hacking minigame that involves moving panels around in a square to create an uninterrupted flow from one circuit to the next. The difficulty ramps up as some panels become immovable and the flow moves faster and faster. Failing the hacking minigame injures you. As mentioned, you can upgrade your hacking ability to make it easier. As for upgrades, these are purchased using Atom, the power behind what drives the world of Rapture. Through experimentation and scientific research, they tapped into this unique power known as Atom, allowing you to use plasmids as well as become stronger in various ways. You obtain Atom by either rescuing or harvesting the Little Sisters. This is presented as a difficult moral choice to the player. Sacrifice the childlike Little Sister to gain additional Atom? Or do you rescue her, sparing her life but gaining less Atom? Without spoiling anything, let me say that there is a character in the game who promises to reward you for not sacrificing the Little Sisters but you'll have to make that decision for yourself. As for the combat, other than the plasmids, it's not too far off from your standard first person shooter, although it does not have the recoil mechanics of modern games and the iron sights are a bit cumbersome to use. I found myself virtually never using the iron sights and sticking to the one-two punch of throwing out a bolt of lightning and then finishing them off with either the wrench or a gun. You can switch between two types of ammo, one better for machines and the other better for humanoids. You can also make use of the environment in many places to dispatch your foes, such as the aforementioned casting of lightning on a puddle of water. If you die, you can instantly revive in a vita chamber nearby with the enemies you killed seemingly gone just like before you died. You can also turn off the vita chambers in the settings if you want to enhance the difficulty of the game. You progress through the game by levels, but not always moving forward. You will at various times have to backtrack to tackle certain enemies, find items, or unlock the way forward. An arrow shows you the way forward unless you turn it off in the settings, and objects you can interact with or pick up are highlighted for your convenience, which is also an option you can turn off. You can locate various items in the game world, including food and medkits to restore health, as well as ammunition and Eve, the resource for your plasmids. While there were a few sections that felt a bit dull to me, like the part where I had to take photos of a couple of enemies, generally the action stayed consistent. So what's the verdict? Well, Bioshock is unquestionably a solidly good game. It was amazingly well received and remains one of the most highly rated PC titles to date. Countless people hold this game in very high esteem and remember fondly their first playthrough and the revelations of the story. And overall, I think it's a good game too. I enjoyed most of my time playing it, barring a few sections like the aforementioned forced photography part. However, the game didn't grip me like it has so many others. 
Yes, it has an amazing visual art style and world design, and yes, it has excellent sound design and good gameplay, but it just wasn't the stellar experience to me that I thought it would be. To begin, I'll hit on some gameplay elements I wasn't a fan of. Some of the plasmids are cool, but I only really felt the need to use a few of them, other than those rare exceptions where it forces you to use a particular plasmid. I just kept using fire, lightning, and ice plasmids, and that's pretty much it. The default mouse keyboard control scheme for switching between weapons and plasmids and among the various options therein was difficult for me to adjust to. I found myself accidentally selecting the wrong plasmid, the wrong weapon, or selecting a weapon when I meant to select a plasmid and vice versa. The scroll wheel on the mouse scrolls in the opposite direction than what I felt seemed natural, and I found this hard to get used to. In the heat of battle, I would often get frustrated when I wasn't using the intended weapon or plasmid because I accidentally hit something else by mistake, or I skipped past the intended selection in my rush to take down the opponent. Furthermore, and this is partially my fault, but I found myself constantly running low on ammo or E, the ammo resource for plasmids. I also found myself constantly having to reload in the middle of battle, and it takes a long time to reload. It's partially because I kept messing up or missing, but also because many of the enemies felt like they took a few too many shots to take down. Battles with the tougher enemies in the game, like the big daddies, often felt like ammo draining bullet sponge fests. I would walk away from some of these battles with depleted reserves of med kits and ammunition. While the game features many vending machines that serve as inhuman merchants in the game, I constantly found myself low on cash. And while we're on the topic, let's discuss my personal issues with these vending machines in the game. I totally understand the need for including these as a game mechanic, but I couldn't help but have my suspension of disbelief hurt by these things. I just can't fathom why a supposedly utopian city, secluded from the rest of the world at the bottom of the ocean, would need a bunch of vending machines spread throughout it in which people can purchase ammunition for guns and upgrades for offensive plasmids. I know, this is a game mechanic issue, but the effort to integrate it into the game world pulled me out of the experience. If you compare this to, say, Fallout 4, you'll see what I mean. In Fallout 4, by no means a perfect game, it makes sense that vendors sell ammunition and weapons, because those are needed in a hostile post-nuclear world. Furthermore, when it's time to level up your skills, it's such a metagame concept that no effort is made to integrate the act of leveling into the game's world. That is to say, this skill tree is not meant to be part of the actual game world. It's just this out-of-game metagame concept visible only to the player, not to the protagonist in the game. In Bioshock, these machines are designed and meant to be part of the actual game world, visible to the protagonist in the game, and this seems completely out of place for the setting of Rapture. I know that this is a personal gripe, but it just felt unnatural even within the context of the suspension of disbelief that I had for the game. Essentially, I'm saying that it pulled me out of the experience and made me question the world design. And on that subject, why would such a civilization take such efforts to research what is essentially military technology? I mean, what purpose would it serve for the citizens of Rapture to run around buying and using offensive fire and lightning plasmids from these vending machines, and who is running these machines? Furthermore, why would they give these machines a comical circus aesthetic, complete with laughing clown voices? Obviously, I don't expect everything in the game to make complete sense, but this was way too much of a stretch for me. I totally understand their efforts to research how to enhance human beauty and strength. I mean, any advanced civilization would want to improve upon the human body, such as making people more attractive or giving them a more effective immune system. But giving people the ability to shoot lightning from their hands? I can't imagine why they would make such a thing freely available to anyone and everyone in clown-themed vending machines spread throughout the city. I know I harped on that point, but it was a big one for me. For others, maybe not so much, and that's fine. I understand not everyone puts the same value on the same things in a game. In addition to that vending machine grind, I found it difficult at times to believe that Rapture was real given that the entire world I played through felt so carefully crafted and tailored to the path I was meant to take. You couldn't veer off into specific residential or business districts, and much of the game world you play in felt fairly confined and claustrophobic. This was just another world design and believability issue that I encountered. Again, I want to stress that I didn't dislike Bioshock, but the above issues, combined with some of my personal preferences for game aesthetic, world design, and the lack of more RPG-like elements, led me to have a solidly good, but not overwhelmingly great experience with Bioshock. To me, it felt more like a play-it-once-and-forget-it type first-person shooter, far different from its spiritual predecessor. Bioshock is definitely worth playing for any fan of first-person shooters, but don't expect this to feel like a worthy follow-up to System Shock 2. What do you think of Bioshock? Specifically, how do you compare it to the System Shock series? Please leave your comments below, like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you haven't already, and make sure to check the description for my Twitter, Twitch, and other links. I'm Fox with Foxio Games, and I'll see you next time.